Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Follow that, hey. <laughs> Thank you, team. That was incredible, incredible. Even just from standing backstage, I could feel the energy. That was amazing. Yes, wow. So happy Mother's Day to all the mums out there. I hope today you feel appreciated. Um, I think mums are amazing. You guys do an incredible job. It's really hard work to be a mum, I hear. Probably why I haven't taken up that role myself yet um, and we yeah we just want to say mums you're amazing and we appreciate you I personally think my mum is amazing she's here tonight she didn't know I was gonna say this but um, and I want to tell you a little bit about why my mum is amazing <laughs> she's sitting there cringing now um, well the the main reason, well, one of the reasons I think my mom is amazing is because she had to put up with me as a child. <laughs> um, so I'm an only child. Uh, I'm an only child that went to private school. And already, be, already that's two sort of key ingredients in the recipe of forming a spoilt brat. <laughs> um, add to that my own sort of personality of, you know, I'm a little bit stubborn, I, I'm quite impatient, I quite like what I want um, now, and I don't like waiting for it, um, I love shopping, I love stuff, so all of those things, even more, just run the risk of uh, that spoilt brat uh, coming out in me, but I, uh, so my parents were pretty up against it when it came to raising a decent, well-rounded human being, um, but uh, without wanting to, you know, blow my own trumpet, I think they did a pretty good job. Um, <laughs> that wasn't me fishing for a compliment, I promise. Um, no, I think they did a good job, but the, the route to uh, raising a decent human being and not having a sport brat, I'm sure, was not an easy one for my mum to navigate. Uh, it was full of tantrums, tears, uh, stomping up the stairs, slamming doors, and the occasional full-on lying on the floor meltdown. Um, and I want to tell you about one particular occasion where it was a, a tricky tantrum for my mum to, to navigate. Um, I can remember we were on holiday in America. I was probably about eight years old. Um, we'd gone out there to you know, travel around. My dad loves road trips, so we did that. But we also we, we met up with a, a family who we knew from the UK who'd moved back over there. They had a daughter who was a similar age to me. Her name was Alex. And we went to, one day we went to some sort of, I don't know, it was like a zoo, aquarium, theme park style thing that they have in America, and, you know, out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, we had a great time. And I can remember it was coming to the end of the day. And uh, I don't know about you, but... When it comes to the end of the day of, of being out at either a museum or a zoo or an aquarium or a theme park or something, does anyone else think that one of the best things about going to those places is going to the gift shop at the end? Like, so my hope was like, yes, okay, I, I want to go to this gift shop. I'm, I'm ready for this. But, um, but we were like, right, we've got to go home. Uh, car park's closing. We need to get home. We're not going to the gift shop. <sighs> you know, a bit sad, but I took it. It was okay. So for some reason, we, we went back to the cars. For some reason, we got separated from the other family, Alex and her family. Um, we met up at the car at the end of the day as we were about to go home, and I found out some terrible news, some really terrible news. Alex got to go to the gift shop. I know. I was livid. <laughs> Hugh, a full-on tantrum from eight-year-old Helena. Um, there were tears. I think it went something along the lines of, Helena's got to go to the gift shop. You said I couldn't get to go. Get to go. Why did she get to go? And I didn't. La, 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 la. Um, and then I uttered the line that most parents in the room, I'm sure, will shudder when they hear. And it went something like this. But it's not fair. It's not fair. Yeah, all you parents out there, you probably hate that line, right? I'm getting a few good few nods in the front row. But it, was, it, but it was so unfair. I didn't get to go. She got to go. But my parents had nothing that they could say or do about that. They just had to put me in the car, crying all the way home. Uh, and you'll be pleased to know I did recover in the end, and I'm pretty much over it now, 20 odd years on. <laughs> um, but actually, it's that subject that I want to talk to you about today, not about childhood tantrums or how to manage them, because I've got no idea. Um, but this subject of it's not fair. 
Because life is unfair at times, isn't it? I think we've all had those moments where we think it's not fair. We feel things are not fair maybe when something negative has happened to us, uh, that it wasn't actually a consequence of our own doing, it wasn't our fault. Because sometimes that's actually easier to cope with, isn't it? When, when we feel actually maybe we've brought this on ourselves. We feel things are unfair when, uh, you know, our reality doesn't match up to our expectations, when we feel like we're not where we should be or where we could be. You know, maybe you've felt like this before as well. Maybe you didn't get on the course that you hoped to get on to. Maybe you didn't get those exam results you studied really, really hard for. Maybe you didn't get the promotion at work. Maybe someone else got it instead and you think actually you could do a better job than them. Maybe you've had to use your hard-earned savings uh, to pay for something like fixing up something in the house instead of going on that holiday you really wanted. Maybe your child doesn't sleep through the night, but all the other children in the NCT group do. Yeah, some mums out there relating to that. Maybe you're struggling to conceive and everyone else around you is having babies. Maybe you can't seem to find the peace and happiness you feel you should have when your life looks good on paper. Now, all of these things represent a sense, I think, of personal injustice. That it's not fair moment. Personal injustice. It's the sense of disparity or inequality. And, and it's at that point where our hope levels can be at their lowest. In the face of injustice, we can feel powerless. We can feel out of control and therefore hopeless. When we can't see a way out, we can't see a solution, we all need hope. So this is why we are addressing this issue in our new series, in our new campaign, The Hope Initiative. You know, hope is probably one of my favorite things, my favorite concepts, so much so that I got it tattooed on my foot. It was my first ever tattoo in Spanish, much to my mother and my parents' disapproval. Little did they know that it was way more worse to come. I got a lot more. Anyway, um, <laughs> so hope, as Pastor Tom said, is a confident expectation for good. It's the belief that things will be better despite the current situation. It's a stance of anticipation that something or someone is going to help make things better. That something's going to change. You know, without hope, there's despair. We all need hope. So in order to restore hope, in order to inspire hope for ourselves, for others, we need to know what to do in the face of injustice. So we've talked about personal injustice, but then what about the whole wider issue of injustice, societal injustice, global injustice? You know, we unfortunately in the world today, we still see people being treated differently because of their gender or because of the color of their skin. You know, this last week we had International Women's Day, incredible thing, yeah. But, you know, that wouldn't need to exist unless we were trying to redress the balance that was already tipped because of hundreds of years of people being treated unfairly, of women being treated unfairly. You know, we've come very far in the last 100 years since women, women were given the right to vote, but we still have so far to come. I think we, um, we can all agree that the recent revelations of the Times Up, that sparked the Times Up movement or the Me Too campaign show that we've still got so far to come. And I was so inspired a few weeks ago on this very platform, we heard from four amazing young women who uh, talked about and shared about the, the struggles that they faced growing up, not just growing up because they were female, but also growing up because of uh, their skin color. And the, the, I was astounded by the, sort of the insidious racism that still exists in our society today. There is still so much injustice that we can face. Then as well as insidious racism, we have the very overt xenophobia and racism that we've, we've seen in our nation since the Brexit campaign. It's a very unintended consequence of that campaign. And just this week, actually, um, I'm a GP. Uh, I had a patient tell me this week that uh, when he migrated from Albania when he was a teenager, but since the, the Brexit referendum, uh, he has faced regular abuse from his work colleagues, things that I can't even repeat on this platform, uh, saying things like, when are you going to get sent back? You know, these we, people are still facing horrendous injustice in our very society here in Norfolk today. 
You know, in my day-to-day work, I see people from all walks of life on a daily basis, um, and I'm all too aware of the injustice that is still in our society. I've seen women who are controlled, coerced, abused by their partners. I've met people marginalized in their own community because of a diagnosis that they have. Um, I've cared for people living in poverty, and I've cared for people who live with significant wealth. We, you know, I, I could go on talking about say the war in Syria, millions of people being displaced uh, due to war, human trafficking, people being exploited, and slavery being the worst it ever has been, even when it was legal. There's so much we could cover, and I'm, but I'm not going to depress you all just tonight. But it's easy to lose hope when faced with these situations, when faced with injustice in our society and injustice around the world. And as I said, I think the reason that we can feel so hopeless is because we can feel so powerless um, and so unable to change something or feel like there's there's, the problem is too great or that there are too many problems to face so what's the answer what do we do in these situations of personal or societal or global injustice I think to find the answer we need to look to a man in the Bible who can safely, I can safely say, I think, has faced one of the worst examples of personal injustice in history. And that man's name is Job. So, as a bit of background, Job, uh, he's a guy in the Old Testament, he had a whole book written, written about him, and he had everything. Uh, he had a wife, he had lots of children, he was really well off with lots of livestock. And the Bible says of him that he was blameless and upright, and that he feared God and shunned evil. And get this, he also says that he was the greatest man amongst all the people of the East. That's a pretty cool thing to, you know, like put on your business card or something. Greatest man in all of these. Um, So things were going going really great for Job. And then he lost it all. Uh, We read this account in Job 1. We have, it's a really harrowing account of his personal injustice unfolding. Uh, Just a summarize it for you a messenger comes along at first and says job um all your oxen and donkeys and all the people looking after it they've all been killed right that's bad then to make things worse while that messenger was still telling him all about his oxen and donkeys being killed another messenger comes along in the same conversation to say all your sheep and all the people looking after your sheep have been killed wow and then another person comes along saying job all your, uh, was it, all your camels, they've been stolen. People have run off with them. And then, finally, just at the wor- when you think things can't get any worse, the, the final messenger comes along and says, Job, your sons and your daughters, that's seven sons, three daughters, they were all having dinner together in a house, and the house just collapsed in on them, killed them all. Wow. Then, just when you think it can't get any worse... The Bible says that Job is afflicted with sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. And those sores were so bad that he tries to scratch them off with a bit of broken pottery. Yeah, that's something that I don't think I've ever seen as a GP in my time. So as personal injustice goes, Job has seen the worst. And I didn't think anyone would begrudge him for him having one of those it's not fair kind of tantrums in that moment. Um, I, I don't know about you, but I can't imagine how bad that must have been for him. How could he have seen the way out in that situation? How could he have kept going? All seemed lost. There was seemingly no hope. Now, obviously there's a a positive end to this situ- to this account otherwise I wouldn't be telling you about it today that would be pretty depressing and mean of me to do that on a Sunday evening on Mother's Day but I don't want to give away the end too quickly I don't want to give away the end just yet and instead I think we need to to look at um, how he navigated this difficult situation what was it that helped Job through How did he respond at this time of hopelessness? And what can we learn vicariously through Job, through his personal injustice? And what was it that restored his hope? So most of the book of Job is him sort of battling with this horrible situation that he's faced. Um, He has some mates that come along and give him some advice. Some of it's really good. Some of it's not so good. Um, But I want to look at a piece of advice that he has given uh, that is good you'll be pleased to know, because um, I think we can learn a lot from it. And it's from a guy called Eliphaz. 
Um, and it says in Job 5, Eliphaz is, is speaking to Job and giving him this piece of advice. And we're going to put the, the verse on the screen for you. I'm going to read it out. It says, Eliphaz saying to Job, But if I were you, I would appeal to God. I would lay my cause before him. He performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted. He provides, provides rain for the earth. He sends water on the countryside. The lowly he sets on high, and those who mourn are lifted to safety. He thwarts the plans of the crafty so that hands achieve no success. He catches the wise in their craftiness, and the schemes of the wily are swept away. Darkness comes upon them in the daytime. At noon they grope as in the night. He saves the needy from the sword in their mouth. He saves them from the clutches of the powerful. So the poor have hope, and injustice shuts its mouth. So, when all seems lost, when hope is at its lowest, when injustice is at its most prevalent, seek God. Now, that means, may seem a fairly obvious thing to say in church. Well, you came to church today, what are you being told? Yeah, seek God, okay. But there's nothing necessarily groundbreaking there, but I want you to come along the journey with me a little bit more as there are more layers to this, these verses, and I think that first meet the eye. Firstly, why seek God? But as it says in that verse, he performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted, all of those things, provides rain for the earth, he sets the lowly on high, he thwarts the plans of the crafty, he saves the needy from the sword, so the poor have hope and injustice shuts its mouth. It describes in this passage how almighty and powerful God is. Wonders that cannot be fathomed, miracles that cannot be counted that even the most clever or crafty foe is no match for God. There is no situation that God cannot rescue someone from, and because of this, we can have hope, and injustice is silenced. I love the way that the message puts this verse, and I'll read it out again to you. It says, After all, he is famous for great and unexpected acts. There is no end to his surprises. He gives rain, for instance, across the wide earth, sends sends water to irrigate the fields. He raises up the down and out, giving firm footing to those sinking in grief. He aborts the schemes of the conniving crooks so that none of their plots come to term. He catches the know-it-alls in their conspiracies, all that intricate intrigue swept out with the trash. Suddenly, they're disorientated, plunged into darkness. They They can't see to put one foot in front of the other. But the downtrodden are saved by God, saved from the murderous plots, saved from the iron fist. And so the poor continue to hope while injustice is bound and gagged. So the first thing that we can do when we face that it's not fair moments, when we face personal injustice or when we are frustrated by the injustice that we see in the world around us is we can seek God and we can acknowledge how awesome he is. We need to tell ourselves that. We need to remind ourselves of how the the power, the majesty, and the wonder of God. As I said before, I think the main factor when we face injustice that can cause us to feel so hopeless is because we feel like we're not in control, because we are powerless in the situation that we're facing. So in times when we feel we are out of control, Let us look to a God who has all authority, all power, all majesty, and that can work in a situation and bring us through. Let's teach ourselves of God's nature, of what he has done in order to bring hope for our situation. You know, if we can remind ourselves of that, that he performs wonders that cannot be fathomed, that he has miracles that cannot be counted, then we can find hope. There's a few things that I've written down that we're going to put on the screen that I think we can use as a little mantra to ourselves to remind ourselves in that moment. I'm going to read them out to you now. Let's remind ourselves that God is the one who is before all things and in whom all things hold together. That he is the one in all things that he is working for our good. He is the one who heals all your diseases. He is the one who redeems your life from the pit. He is the one who executes justice for the oppressed. He is the one who makes a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. He is the one who is able to do immeasurably more than we can even ask or imagine. He is the one who is said that the mere sound of his name will signal hope. 
We're going to put all those up on the screen so you can take a picture of them for those moments where you have that it's not fair moment. You can recall that, get it up on your phone and remind yourself of those things, the character and the nature of God. But as I said, there are more layers to this. So we want to first acknowledge the amazing power and majesty of of God. But let's go back to the first few sentences of advice that Job is given uh, in this this passage. In Job 5, 8, it says, But if I were you, I would appeal to God. I would lay my cause before him. So the second thing I think we can do in the face of injustice is to take Eliphaz's advice of appealing to God. And what does this mean? It simply means we pray to God. We talk to God. We ask for his intervention. And actually, approaching God is even easier for us now than it was for Job. You know, if you've not been around church before, or if this is one of your first times, you might not know this, but because we have Jesus now, we can have a direct relationship with him you know God squeezed himself into human form walked on this earth 2,000 years ago was crucified as an innocent man taking on all of our sin everything that we've ever done wrong everything that we will do wrong everything that separates us from God he took it on himself and then he rose again to new life defeating that sin defeating death so we can live in direct relationship with God that we can approach him boldly and we can pray to him and we can ask for his help in our situations of injustice that in itself I think is incredible let's not take that for granted that's just a little side note but we need to take our situation to God to Jesus in prayer and it, do you know what? it's okay I think initially to have that maybe that eight-year-old tantrum of it's not fair in those moments we can do that with God but I want to say something that's a little bit challenging for all of us now, and I'm speaking certainly to myself within this, but when we do that, when we take our situation to God in prayer, let's not stay in that mentality of, it's not fair. And let's not just sit back expecting God to fix all of it for us. You know, going back to my eight-year-old self in America, I could have expected that, you know, if I complained long enough or had enough, big enough of a tantrum, uh, that my parents would have given in and taken me to the gift shop and I would have got my own way. And I'm really pleased that they didn't, actually, saying that now in retrospect, um, because then I really would have been a spoiled brat. Um, because in life, we don't get what we want by sitting around and complaining about it. Yeah. And I, I know, and again, I speak to myself and tell myself that. But we often fall into that trap, don't we? We put it on Facebook, we complain to our friends, we rant to our work colleagues, we blame other people even. But the only thing that this achieves is actually inactivating us from taking action to resolve the situation. Maybe sometimes we embrace that lack of control, that in those it's not fair moments. Maybe because it actually absolves us of the responsibility of doing something about it. We say, well, it's out of my hands, it's out of my control. It's not my fault, it's not fair, but there's nothing I can do about it. And actually, if we look back earlier in the passage in the, in the book of Job, Eliphaz pulls Job up on exactly this kind of mentality. He essentially tells Job you know, to stop quarreling with God, stop questioning why is this happening to me, and instead go to God and ask for his help and actually do something about it. So this idea that we actually need to do something after we take our unjust situations to God is actually the, comes on to the next part of our scripture. It says, but going back, but if I were you, I would appeal to God, I would lay my cause before him. I would lay my cause before him. You know, what this says to me is actually we need to have a cause to lay before God. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to have a cause? The dictionary definition is a principle, aim, or movement to which one is committed and to which one is prepared to defend or advocate. To be part of a cause is to be part of something that's bigger than ourselves. It's taking action to be part of a solution to the problems that either we face or other people face. In the face of societal injustice, we need to be gathering together to be mobilizing as a group of people to help to give a voice to those who cannot speak for themselves, to be active and not just accepting the status quo. Uh, in doing so, we can bring hope. We can restore hope to those suffer, who suffer under injustice. 
You know, this is a really a biblical principle that's echoed in the New Testament as well. In James 2, 14 to 17, it says this, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or a sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, goodbye and have a great day, stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Wow. So we first need to stir our faith that God is who, who all he says he is and that he can do all that he says he can do. But then we need to step out in that faith. We need to be God's hands and feet on this earth. You know, our stance in the face of injustice should not be one of hopelessness or helplessness, saying, what can I do? But instead, it should be a stance of, what can I do? It was exact, that exact thought that um, a lady called Christine Kane, you might have heard of her before, she's a, a world-renowned preacher, um, and when she landed in an airport in Greece many years ago, she saw these posters up around in the airport of missing women. And she asked the question, well, where are they? What's happened to them? And someone just said, human trafficking. She was astounded. She could not believe it. But unlike many people who had gone before her and seen those posters and just accepted the fact that they were powerless to do anything about it, she thought, hey, what can I do about it? And in that moment, just shortly after her trip, her and a a small group of people and a, uh, a word a logo that was made in word, um, formed the A21 campaign. The A21 campaign, you might have heard of it, but now uh, it is an intercontinental organization that not only raises awareness globally of human trafficking and the issues of human trafficking, but it rescues and rehabilitates people from human trafficking. And it, not only that, even that is amazing in itself, but it also helps uh, prosecute the people who are perpetrating human trafficking. Just like Christine Kane, we, with God, can do anything. We work in his strength, not our own. Uh, We work with others that are passionate about the same cause. We can restore hope to those that need it. What is the ultimate cause that we can all be a part of? The one that unifies all people, no matter what background, what life experience, what age, what gender, what culture, what race, what is the ultimate cause that brings hope to all people? And that is the cause of Christ. The cause of Christ is to seek and to save those who are lost, to see everyone to come into relationship with Jesus, a relationship that goes on from now into eternity. You know, as a church, we are motivated by that cause. It is the center of everything that we do. It is our vision, and it is, which is the salvation of our city. It forms everything that we do, and it's the reason, every, is the way we do things. You know, to see people come into relationship with him, with Jesus, and live the life that he has in store for them. To see others able to connect with that hope that comes through knowing God in the face of personal or societal injustice. So, I need to wrap things up soon. But to sum up, I thought I would take a leaf out of Phil Temple's book, my husband, you might have heard him speak before, uh, and use a nice little bit of alliteration. Um, Just to kind of sum everything up, it's good to remember, right? Um, So when we face injustice, either personal injustice or global injustice, we can find hope through doing these three things. Firstly, to acknowledge the power and authority of God. We then can appeal to God in prayer. And then we need to act. We need to be part of the solution to to the challenge that we or others face. And I said I'd tell you about how it worked out for Job in the end, and it did work out well for him. You know, following a long discussion with his friends and actually an interaction with God himself, Job prays to God. He acknowledges God's authority. And then he then goes on to the action he takes is he ends up helping his friends become right with God because they gave him some bad advice. But he, he, takes, he steps out in faith himself. And get this, in Job 42.12, it says that the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. 
You know, what if we could be quicker than Job in this realization? I'm going to take 42 chapters in the, of the Bible in the book of Job. What if each time we face injustice, we could quickly find hope through doing those three things? Through acknowledging God in his power, through appealing to him and then through taking action with God. What if instead of a reaction to injustice like that we, we can pretend to do, like anger, frustration, retaliation, uh, inactivity, shying away, accepting the status quo, what if instead of doing that, each and every one of us, in the face of injustice, we sought God and became part of the solution? I think not only would we find hope in our own personal situations, not only would our lives be blessed through coming through difficult situations, coming out of the other side of them, realizing that we are stronger than we realize that we are and that we are more blessed than we were in the former part of our lives. Not only this, but we can then in, to in turn show others, show our city, show our nation that there is hope. We can be living examples to others. Finally, we can join together and be hope for other people. We can be Jesus' hands and his feet by being part of a cause, by being part of the cause, by being part of the solution to the injustice that we see around us. So what I'm going to do right now, I think we need a, a moment to reflect on all of that. So why don't you all stand and we're going to be led by the bands. But I'll stand, I'm going to come back and Give anyone here an opportunity tonight, if you, if you don't know this Jesus that I've been speaking about, if you don't know the, the hope that God can bring, I want to offer you that opportunity to connect with him.